yeah, there's no official start. We just chat. But I do want to say, first thing, this is very exciting to me mm -hmm. for many reasons. One is we are doing our first English episode. I'm meeting two new ladies that I haven't met before. That's uh, always, always great to experience, meet new people. And mostly you kind of work in an area which even though I'm an athlete basically all my life, I have almost zero knowledge about. It's about sport and social work and activism and just basically you're kind of devoted for a I don't know, positive change in the world. And so for that reason, I want to thank you very much for being here. And we have Diane yes, and Sylvia. Yes. You are from Brazil? Yes, far away. Uh, very far, far away. <laughs> Even more reason for excitement. <laughs> and Sylvia, uh, you are Macedonian, but uh, of course, we'll, we'll just go on in English. So thank you very much. Very pleased to, to meet you and to have you here. And yeah, we can just start, I guess, with you giving a rough background. Well, how come you are where you are at this time and place in the world? <laughs> oh my God, that's difficult to say like in uh, little words. Me and Sylvia, we met in the United States in a program to empower women to make the world a better place and more equal place. And since then we have been in touch. I work with conflict resolution. She works with sports development. I worked with sports for development as well. And then we joined strength and knowledge to do something here in Skopje. So now we are here developing and putting, realizing the dream that we dreamt together. Awesome. Yes. Anything yes, yes. to add? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I've met Diana 2016 when we were selected to, as she said, to participate in this program called Global Sports Mentoring Program. It's a flagship program of the State Department at the USA. Okay. It's an amazing program where basically they select each year 16 girls from different countries nominated through their embassies to participate at, I think it was like two month mm -hmm. uh, long program at the at United States. Um, I think in 2016 we stayed, it was a long time ago, we stayed in Washington DC, then we went to our mentor site, so we, we were all appointed with different mentors uh -huh. from the sports sector at the USA. For example, my mentor was from the NHL, the National Hockey League, oh, okay. uh, so I stayed three weeks with one of the female leaders there, uh, job shadowing and learning more on uh, how things are done within their context. Uh, and then we went also for uh, to California for a very important uh, conference, summit. It's always about gender equality, empowerment of women through sport. Which was amazing, it was like big and fancy. And it was super fancy. It was the yeah. fanciest thing I've ever seen. The in my one life. in California. <laughs> the one in California, a super nice um, resort with many, many legends and famous TV personalities from yeah. states. And we oh, saw wow. many athletes as well. So it was very, very interesting. Uh, but this was still the same core group, the one that was selected for this kind yes. of program. Yes. So basically we started talking at the, at the podcast about the GSMP. Yeah. <laughs> it became natural. GSMP is the shortcut for the short, the, the abbreviation for global sports mentoring program. Okay. So when we are selected, when we were selected, our cohort from that generation, 2016, we went for two months stay uh, at the USA. So there was a program and within that program, we also traveled to this fancy, super high oh, okay. profile conference on gender equality right. and we also had our times with our mentors my mentor was from nhl but yes. diana's uh, mentor was uh, also sachi and sachi is a multinational marketing enterprise oh not doesn't necessarily have to be with sports no they wanted to develop so the program is about how i make you a better professional more empowered woman to make a difference in the world so they wanted to 
to put us in a high level, high standard, learning with very knowledgeable pe people so we can grow as a woman in society. So they believe that um, empowered women would be a better world, a more equal world, considering how society is organi right. organized. So they did everything. They, they still doing everything to make us become or be or develop as a woman in society. Nice, very nice. All sounds very fancy to me. It was so very it fancy. For me, it was uh, also uh, very uh, shocking in a very positive way because it was the first time that I went to the USA, 2016. And I will always remember this, that at the second day of the program, the organizers, two, two beautiful ladies, uh, Dr. Ash and Dr. Sarah, approached to me and they asked me whether I'm interested to go to the White House because my mentor from the NHL uh, had an event there uh, with the hockey team I remember and that. there was a reception and at the moment I thought it's a trick question because I was like who invites you to go to the White House it was Obama at that time the president no. of the United States so now uh, I always tell this story because it was the first time I go to the USA and the third day I go to meet Obama and to go to be the reception <laughs> at the White House it's like really like awesome. once in a lifetime it happens that's and it a, did happen to that's me that's a dream state yes. that's like okay well, I, I have to go back from this dream because I have to find a kind of a touch with reality. So 2016, you are chosen to go there. Why are you even chosen? What, how come you were, uh, you said you were nominated by, by what? They do a selection process with a lot of criteria. So you need to be doing some important job in the sense that you have a social impact with whatever you are doing. Yeah. So in yeah. Brazil, I work in communities affected by crime and violence. Brazil is a very unequal country and have lots of social problems. So we have the slums there, yeah? Yeah. Like yeah. A very poor, affected by poverty yeah. and crime that are our community. If it's anything near to the movies I've seen, then that's Yes, not it is exactly nice. how you see in the movies, unfortunately. It's quite violent. Okay. So I worked with uh, Fight for Peace International, it's an international organization for peace building. So we work with martial arts sports to develop ah. these young people. So they have a choice within the territory. They could either join a gang, what happens right. a lot. So we were another option through sports. So as it was very affected by violence, usually the young people feel attracted to learn how to fight. Yes. So we use martial art as a bait in the sense that once they are inside the organization, the coaches, I train the coaches, for example, how can you use sports for personal development? How can you use sports for anger management? How can you use sports for conflict resolution, to know yourself, to balance your emotions, to talk to each other, to see a better future for yourself? So that is what I was doing by the time I was elected to come. Beautiful. Beautiful. And hard. <laughs> oh, I can only... <laughs> I, I don't know if I can even guess. So, so yeah, that, that was exactly what I, what I wanted to know. You were obviously already heavily kind of engaged, engaged in, in this. Yeah. Because you nobody's going to select you just uh, like no. randomly. And, and it's 16 people around the world. Like it's a lot of people, you know, few people to select in the world. So everyone who were in the program was fantastic people so inspiring i was inspired by Sylvan, but all the other women there from from kenya or from nigeria or from all over the world now yeah. that i can imagine all of you individually are already hugely impactful but then they bring you together exactly so how come you were selected because of my look <laughs> <laughs> i'm joking obviously so i've been um I've been involved in sports for for all my life. Um, I've been doing a lot of sports. I, I'm outdoor person, so I love outdoor sports. Kay. I've been doing paragliding, Tom, and we have a beautiful mountains to fly. Yeah, she said around. she's gonna take me paragliding. I'm waiting Pl for that. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> in two days, yes. Uh, and um, so I've been uh, doing a lot of paragliding. I was a national paragliding pilot. I've been traveling the world for many years. I'm a professional paragliding pi pilot. So we have a paragliding oh. national team that competes. And many, many years ago, I used to be part of that. <laughs> I don't even remember how many years how many years ago but they were quite a lot um, but when I stopped doing professional uh, sport paragliding I somehow still got attached to sports in general because sports 
uh, and th this will uh, also bring us to a different topic associated with sport because sport is not only about high performance and competitions and awards it's also about everything a sport can learn and can yeah. can teach you yeah. so uh, when I stopped professionally being involved in sport with paragliding then I had an NGO called TACT uh, then we were very impactful in um, delivering social change through sport so we use sport as a platform to raise awareness about pressing issues some of the pressing issues that we worked on were discrimination gender-based discrimination discrimination for people with disability or um, athletes not having their voices heard that very mm. often happens in our context as well so i was working i was doing a lot of work uh, and uh, we were implementing projects that were also supported by the u.s embassy at that time in north macedonia okay. so when they reached out uh, to me uh, i already knew about this program because i think we have a mutual friend elena she she went yes. before me to the same program uh, so when they reached out i knew more or less what it was about and okay. of course when they selected me among all the other uh, participants interviews uh, then uh, I was I was super happy and then this is how I got to to be selected to go in 2016 at, at, at USA nice and the good thing is now that we went back it was this last summer that we went back, uh, back. to the to the GSMP again okay to the US to the US because they had um, 10th year 10th anniversary of that program that they have created oh, and yep. 50 years anniversary of the title nine uh, of their law that basically uh, helped women have equal opportunities and equal access to sports among the other fields as well so we were selected from all the other uh, years um, for 10 years uh, since 10 years that gsmp exists we were selected and we were together now the group was bigger was around 25 girls that uh, we went this uh, summer in uh, usa and we had a great time because the the program was a bit different this time we didn't had mentorship but mm. we had a very good course on entrepreneurship at one of the uh -huh. best um, colleges university babson university at usa at boston uh, and then we had we flew to Washington DC to be at this high level event with uh, First Lady Jill Bi Biden and uh, some other prominent yeah, uh, female legends conferences to um, to let's say celebrate uh, yeah. their success their successes like at USA Hall of Fame reunion they've all gathered yeah, you ten, yes, ten yes. years <laughs> later it was so nice to see each other again uh, because it was a surprise we didn't know that this was coming so it was a very nice surprise when we both received the email invitation that we are selected to go yeah totally surprised. oh you so didn't know no. you didn't know she was going no no. no no we wow. were talking the, in the over zoom i think and i said so i got invited to this thing and they said oh my god me too yeah. because we were discussing about the project we do it now in macedonia before so we were in touch a lot yeah so then we're very happy to know that we were together there. Very nice. I, I'm already connecting these okay. dots. Like, okay, <laughs> you're all functioning and impacting in these areas, but then this organization brings you together and just kind of injects a bit more knowledge. Okay, you might mm -hmm. need some inter entrepreneurship. So yeah. I guess that's how now you're founding your own companies and just, I don't know, I, I can understand how like these different pockets of knowledge from different mm -hmm. areas will help you in the future and whatever yeah. your plans and are. And if you think deeper, through sports, they are bringing cultures together. Brazilian Everything. culture, Macedonian culture, I'm here. Be immersive in like understanding how this country works, what kind of conflicts do you have, how do you deal with things. So there's a study that said, as more as I know a different culture, it's um, the probability of war and disagreement, it's reduced. Yeah. So that's why it's also sports for diplomacy or for peace building in a broader way. Yeah. I, I've always felt that intuitively. You mentioned a couple of points like sport. W when you say performance, it's not really just about, okay, win first place competition or things like that. It, it's more of knowing yourself, knowing your limits. And now, as I'm learning actually even deeper about performance, the highest performers are actually, uh, they're motivated by reasons beyond them. And so that's what I'm seeing here. 
sport is beyond the individual. Mm -hmm. So now you're actually, th that's how that embodies. When, when you say it's not just words, okay, sport, unite, nations, blah, blah, blah. No, th these are like the real pla practical examples. Yeah. And you are an athlete yourself, right? Yes, yes. I've changed several sports. Most notably, I was a track and field mm -hmm. uh, uh, runner. And what did you learn from it? Uh, at, I was, at that time, I just learned my physical limits. Because mm -hmm. I was a uh, high school student and then a student. I was just running to get to the Olympics. <laughs> wow. Run for the club, run for the... I don't know, national championships, run for the national team, go outside and uh, so not much really, just my, my, my physical limits. What am I capable of? And your mind limit as well. That came later. Well, retroactively, I'm aware <laughs> that I've <laughs> hit you certain, have done that. <laughs> yeah, very, that's very true actually. And, and it's something that we talk about often here on the podcast. Yeah. There's a quote that says the mind shapes the body. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. I agree. It, yeah. But it's bi-directional. Mm -hmm. like with yeah, your body, course. you can also shape your mind. Yeah. And with the activities and all that. Um, okay. Well, you both kind of came to the same point of, uh, okay, that was the background. That was all the uh, things that did you, but now you're here in Macedonia. Uh, what a we can we can go into more detail uh, why exactly you're here what kind of workshops are we doing and what are we actually trying to change right so now so i work with a conflict prevention conflict management and peace building and as i have been in the sports sector before and now i have a company called peace flow that i deliver training and consultancy for government companies people mm. communities on how to deal with conflict and it's pretty much kind of Conflict repeats itself because we're all human beings. We all have kind of the same challenge in de dealing with something that bothers me, how I communicate that, how I deal with that. So I came here to kind of blend this knowledge together with sports for development. So Sylvia's knowledge with my expertise, delivering this content to a group of coaches and athletes in North Macedonia. Aha. Uh -huh. Was this something that you thought of doing or something was already happening and you were invited to? No, we created the whole thing. It's, uh, uh, so it's completely your initiative. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I always wanted to collaborate with one of the girls from the GSMP. We have this possibility to col collaborate among us. So I know that she's a great expert on nonviolent communication because I took her course a couple of years ago. She did a mm. course for all, all the girls participating in the program. And it really resonated a lot with with me uh, because by person I, I, I can acknowledge that sometimes I can be judgmental in my conversations I have prejudice sometimes and I fight this very often but then um, when I took that course I mean understood more on how important it is to understand the need of the other person or how to have a meaningful conversation and how to have um, compromise and to have a win or win-win situation in whatever we do um, her course and her expertise helped me personally, personally a lot. And since I know very well the sports sector here, I've been involved mm. in NGO sector, in the gov government as well. And I know that in general, we lack communication, good constructive communication. Lack. We lack. We lack. Macedonians. Yes. We do. No, no, I know. We have. I know. <laughs> At least that I know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I can say, unfortunately, for the sports sector, that's also the case. And uh, the level of understanding about conflict management and the power of nonviolent communication is something very new here. So when I, uh, when I approached Diana, when we started brainstorming about this idea of having her coming here, I knew it's going to be very helpful and beneficial for the participants. And at the same time, it will be a bit challenging because it's always when you introduce a new topic, mm. as, especially among people who are usually in the field, like coaches, like athletes. You know, then don't think about much more about these um, feelings, emotions and needs. They are much more focused on their performance. Right. But this is such an important part of their career, 
as an athlete or as a coach or as a professional in any kind of professional set setup. So uh, we came up with this project that was supported by the GSMP. That is how Diana is here. And we have organized together with uh, the, the NGO that I have founded, Sports Social Solutions, in partnership with the Olympic Committee of North Macedonia, we uh, organized uh, workshops targeting coaches and athletes. And today we had the first workshop mm -hmm. with a mixed group of coaches and athletes. And I can say that it went very good. Yeah. Of course, there is always parts or someone in the group that when you introduce new topic that can be a bit of like um, suspicious or resistant maybe or like resistant, resistant yeah. to new things because it's something that you're not that you don't it's a challenging sometimes to think that you are there's another way of doing it yeah uh, you don't know everything that you don't know any everything because people here very often they think all that they all know they everything know everything right <laughs> yeah. and uh the first step is to acknowledge that you don't know everything there's so much exactly more to learn right, yeah. so it was a very very interesting um, workshop and i think it's very beneficial and helpful for everyone that was at today's workshops and next day workshops because it's something that they teach them how to, uh, as she says, how to lead these meaningful uh, non-conflict conversations and uh, having to, that can be very helpful in professional setup, in your private life, mm. with your family, with your spouse and so on and yeah. so forth. Uh, so it's a very interesting concept and Diana can explain more on that. It was even new to me a couple of years ago. I first heard it from her, but it, I can say that it's something that we really need and it's something that is very helpful to, to every individual. Well, I hope they, the individuals, understand that even if their concern is just their definition of performance, even in their definition of performance, these things will actually help them. Like in the long run, in the short run, these things actually help their performance. So I hope they understand that and don't be, they quit the resistance soon enough. Yeah, no, they were, they were engaged with the process and it's very dynamic. They're like, game five as well game five as well mm -hmm. so it's not only me there standing and talking for four hours yeah they are changing ideas and like making some problem solving games so they can actually understand because conflict resolution is not theoretical you need to practice and you put your mind to think and force yourself to think in a different way and what i usually see generally is that people tend to ignore emotions as if they didn't exist, right? Mm -hmm. Like anger, frustration, sadness. There are so many. And they just want to pretend it doesn't exist. But difficult conversations pretty much about how you are being impacted by something, it's your emotions. Do you think they, they pretend? Did you, did you say pretend? Yeah. Do you think they pretend there's no emotions or they're just not aware that their emotions are, dri are just driving them without their awareness of it. Both. It's kind of, okay, I see that my athletes is uh, frustrated because of something, but I don't really want to talk about that. Oh, I see what I you're saying. Okay. I don't know how to deal if I talk to my daughter and she start to cry herself out because I don't know how to deal with that. So it's a lot of not having the practice or okay. the skill so how do I deal with that? So how do I approach a conversation? What if I want to punch this person? What if I get really angry? Mm. What if I want to cry? Then you avoid because you don't know how to deal with that. It, it, are we okay to mention some of the participants? Like you mentioned coaches and athletes. Can yeah, we say were, which exactly were they? They were, they were different coaches from different federations and different sports. We had coaches for swimming. We had coaches okay. from skiing, track from judo, from track and field, from nice. triathlon, oh, uh, from bodybuilding. There's somebody I know judo. then. Someone, I know yeah. somebody there. Probably. Awesome. awesome. I don't know their name, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that was enough. I, I just, I'm actually very happy that that you actually took those people and, and show them some of these things because I know they'll get a lot a lot out of it. Yeah, and they then, said so. Yeah, and they then in a few months I'll have somebody here and we'll talk about oh, I know, I some them. Oh, world I know champion that helped me. Uh, I don't want to lose my thought because that that one thing you mentioned with uh, how do you actually approach resolving conflicts like that or when people just shut aside emotions 
And off camera, you mentioned empathy. And that's mm -hmm. something I'm, I kind of feel very close to me. Mm -hmm. I work, I function with empathy a lot. I'm assuming that was kind of a big part of, yes. of how you yes. at least approach a person of a method of how to yeah. deal with it and with others. So empathy is about listening with your heart with no judgment. Yeah. yeah? So you present you with no judgment. With no no judgment is the key That's of it. Yeah. So people sometimes confuse it's like if I listen to you, it means that I agree with you. And one thing mm. is one thing, and the other thing is the other thing. Yeah. So I can listen to what you're telling me. I can empathize with you. I can I can mirror what you're saying that's very important, even though I don't agree with the way you think. But if I can listen to you, and once you feel understood, you feel she sees me, she knows where I'm coming from, then I have space afterwards to disagree with you, or you have more ears to listen to what I say. So then you can engage in a conversation. When you're very judgmental, Let's say that I work with you and you're my boss, yeah? And I think you're very uh, bossy. I can't just turn to you and say, you're very bossy, yeah? Because you're going to turn to me and say, well, do you think you are? Like, you're messy, that's why I'm bossy. So then it's the bossy and the messy talking. So this doesn't go anywhere. But if I'm calling you bossy, there's something very important in this relationship that's not happening to me. Probably is like open dialogue, recognition of my work. I want more autonomy and freedom to participate in decision making, something like that. But this is the needs which Sylvia commented, yeah? Universal human needs. And we share, that's a common ground between you and me. Bossy, separate us. Yeah. So if I do think you're bossy, I use this judgment as a map to get to what really matters. So I need to come to you and say, you know, there's something that I need to talk to you. In our work relationship, I feel that uh, to participate in the decision making, to have more autonomy, to have your trust is important to me. And very often I don't see that happening. So I would like to discuss this further with you. So now it's more, you know, space for the dialogue. Yeah, yeah, the tension has been kind of exactly. yeah. lifted. And you see how much we need that in our context as well? It's so rare that people, yes. first of all, you are one of the few people I know that can say that I, 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 I am like empathetic and I have empathy close to my heart. Uh -huh. And I wish there are more people like you I because uh, I don't know uh, many uh, people. Okay. Uh. I don't know many people that can say that because sometimes they also think that empathy is not good. They want to be more harsh, oh. they want to be more, you know, no. straightforward, they want to be, you know, more macho. So, especially hearing men saying that I'm empathetic and I, 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 I live with empathy, for me, it's a, it's a very good thing, so. <laughs> no, thank you. I, I <laughs> see what up. you're saying, but to me, it has never been, a, like, I consider it a superpower. Oh, that's good. Because to me, it never came, I never learned it. I, I don't know why, I mean, I, I can very, with high probability guess it's from my parents or the way I was brought up. But to me, it was always uh, like a like a normal thing that I've always had, which is I which is why I was going to ask you, because I feel it as I've never learned it. I feel like I've always had it. But then you're faced with people that don't and you're faced with the more <coughs> difficult challenge of teaching somebody to oh be God, empathetic yeah. which kind of is conflicting how do you teach somebody being empathetic are there like methods and like are there is there science behind it how do you teach Some that science behind it so marshall rosenberg he's a north american psychologist who organized nonviolent communication the way we know it today okay but it's it's inspired also by Martin Luther King, by Gandhi movement, which is based uh -huh. on a non-violent yes. approach, like generally talking, yeah? So what he says is that why people are so can be empathetic, compassionate and calm, and some other people are aggressive and violent, like why is it that? And then he says, first thing is how you, the way you were taught how to think, yeah? So the way you think, the way you see other people, the way you see the world influences the language you use 
and the way you behave. So maybe you were brought up in a way that since a small age, you were taught to be compassionate towards small animals or mm. to recognize feelings and people, or maybe you were surrounded with people that would show emotions and that would talk about it. I don't know. So yeah. something, because Anything. everyone have the empathetic power, but yeah, the they don't sense. know how to use yeah, it. Everybody yeah, has the sense, be, but yes. it's like... It's blocked somehow. A atrophied, never used. So it's used. about, yes, exactly. It's like a muscle. As more you use, <laughs> yeah. the stronger you get. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, there was one thing that I kind of wrote as a whole paragraph. I guess I, I felt we were come we were gonna come to this point, and it's really part admiration and part uh, a, a, a wonder, a wondering question into your line of work which is, in a broad sense, you're trying to in, uh, invoke a change, either socially, culturally, individually, whatever it is, you're trying to motivate, drive a positive change. And change is a very strange concept mm -hmm. to everybody, but I'm going to give a brief explanation why I think so. On the one hand, us human beings have, we have evolved to actually be like the perfect adaptation machine. Like the human body literally changes to the molecular level if necessary, just to be able to adapt to, to the environment or other internal or outside factors. So we're kind of built for change. Mm -hmm. We should be loving change. People, humans should welcome change in every aspect. But on the other hand, and I'm sure you are much more aware of this, change is like the last thing many yeah. people want to do. Mm -hmm. Yes. How do you deal with this? Because I I've tried and I've given up. I, I'm <laughs> Not given up in a pessimistic way, given up in a hopeful way. Maybe life will bring you to a point at some point when you change. Yeah. But you, you, that's not your approach. Mine is passive and hopeful and okay, maybe karma, whatever. You are, you want to do it. You're driving it. And still, are you faced with like, like failures nonstop? Like, yes. how are you still driving <laughs> these changes? <laughs> so do you want to answer? Yeah, go ahead. I can answer a second. Yeah. So, so many things like in that question. For me, the most difficult feeling to deal with is powerlessness. Ah, okay. Yeah. So it's when you realize that you cannot make the change you want. It doesn't matter how much I work in the slums, for example. They will always be the drug dealers and people get involved with the gangs, and I cannot mm -hmm. change that social reality because it's huge. And when I look at the size of the problem, I feel powerlessness. But for the young people that I have been in touch, in a smaller level, more individual level, and I see they changed, right? Okay. I see the result. I see they can uh, understand themselves in a different way. They feel more motivated. They deal with people in a different way. They are growing. They are evolving in that way. So I think what motivates me is to see that the influence that we have promotes a tangible change. Mm -hmm. I cannot force you to change. I can stimulate and inspire you. A new change if you want to change. And sometimes yeah. people are not ready. They don't want to. They don't see why. And then we need to deal with this powerlessness, horrible uh. feeling. So it's inspirational, motivating, but also the other side of it. Does it make sense? No, it does. But it also makes sense that it's a very specific personal trait of yours. Because mm -hmm. I'm sure many people, when feel powerlessness, just find another thing where they do have power. <laughs> but I see where you're going. Yeah, those little glimpses of 
like uh, positive change even even for a single child is f- is enough for you maybe for others isn't but yeah. it's enough for Many you so give up some people give that's up. why you are you and that's why you are you you were gonna add something yes i would say that i love change like a personally Personal. i love yeah. change i think every change is good uh, in our professional life, in our private life. And you, if you look at my professional life, I'm always changing things uh, because uh, m- maybe I grew up with, with my mother and father always wanting to have the status quo, which means the safe little world, mm-hmm. like the safe job, safe house, safe environment. But then, uh, as we spoke before, it doesn't exist anymore. So you, as you said as well, you need to adapt. Yeah. And somehow it is in my blood that um, I can adapt easily and I won't change. I genuinely won't change. So I'm always looking for change. Whatever I do, I'm looking for change. And I think that it's good when you lead by example as well. So whenever uh-huh, I do okay. any kind of empowerment workshops, trainings, I speak to young people, particularly young people, because in my country, I really see the future in the young, in the young generations. I really try to show them by these tangible results that change is possible and change is good. And sometimes, particularly living in developing countries, you can feel this powers, powerlessness, how do you say it? Yes. <laughs> Uh, because uh, sometimes you can feel little as an indiv- individual but if you look back and if you just see how many lives or how many attitudes you have changed throughout your mm. professional experience you will see that that's not very little maybe it in in my eyes now they see it's not that much but actually that person that we have changed has changed maybe other yeah. 10. So it's a multiplier effect. It's a movement, I would say. It's a little multiplier effect. Like you rec- you can, you, you, you touch one and then the, that one, if he really understands, he, she understands, then they will go on with a message and they will lead by example. And so it's, uh, I think that really even, even by changing one, we change a lot. We change the society. And it's also good when we are activists because I'm an activist in my soul. I really believe in justice and in speaking up uh, vocally and freely about things that I believe in, in my values and principles. It helps a lot when you're reunited with the like-minded people. Because when we live in our own environment, I you see. can be discouraged many times because I have, as you have, as you have many challenges and many Mm. barriers. There are many people saying no, 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 no all the time. So at one point it happened to me as well. You stop and you think, am I crazy? Like maybe they are, no, they are right. What am I doing here? What am I doing? And I thought that when I was drinking in uh, one place. So I really thought like, okay, is everyone is against uh, or everyone has a different setup, like mind setup. so yeah. maybe it's really me that I'm crazy. Maybe it's really me that I'm wrong, you know? So from time to time, it's good to disconnect from this reality where we have our actions and to connect with like-minded people. So when we go to this program, like we reunited, I went now in USA, but also went to France in uh, this a month ago mm-hmm. for a different kind of program. It's always about empowerment and, and feminist movement. Um, and it's it empowers you even more when you a go lot. back to say, Okay, it's not only me. There are many, many like-minded people all around the world. We are fine. Like we have our values and principles Mm -hmm. and we need to continue to do what you do, what you believe in. You are not alone. Yeah. Maybe if you you are alone back there in Brazil in my office doing something, but when I connect to the girls, whatever uh, energy I put into the world is not only my energy, it's like being part of a bigger movement of people thinking how to make good into the world, how to help other people. So it's kind of wave. I am surfing that wave and mm. I'm not alone, you know. So that gives us more strength. Yeah, energy, keep, strength, empowerment. Yeah. And it's always good to go back to that, to that like group of people that, that can inspire you again. See, that's why I love this. In, in, in like a <laughs> half an hour, okay. I've connected so many dots now, like, so many new things make much more sense in literally like a 30 minute conversation. I'm not sure. I I really feel, I don't know, gratitude (laughs) just, just for connecting these because I completely understand now, like 
okay, this one little thing was little today, but yesterday there was another. And in your lifetime, you've accumulated thousands. Yes. But then there's another thousand. Yes. And now the organization makes sense that just, I don't know why thought, I mean, I, now I know why they've thought of, well, let's bring 16 of them together. Now that's 16,000 and then you just escalate. So yeah, yeah. this was, this was a beautiful experience. I kind of want to just feel the, the this newfound yeah. understanding. <laughs> uh, I, we did mention, and I do have in the notes, and it's something obviously a topic that we can have a hundred episodes about, which is gender equality. And in, in, in an attempt to stay within the topic of sport, let's keep it there. Again, in brighten me with more knowledge of what exactly are the challenges of or what is the let's say the bad situation of uh, what, what's the gender inequality oh my god where do we start why <laughs> oh well, i'm hoping if we keep oh. it to the sports maybe you can try and explain it or at least i don't know what what are you doing about it like, okay let's, yeah. let's start there what are you doing about it should i go first yes <laughs> Okay, so my personal story, because it's always connected to me, this is where I get all the strength. If I felt it on my skin, I don't want that to happen to other people, other girls. Mm -hmm. uh, so I try to, uh, that's why I'm very vocal about gender equality, because when I was a Paragon pilot, many times I've been discriminated, gender discriminated, um, without me knowing that. And I will tell you an example of what okay. it means. So I've been training, uh, for example, for many years, and we were going for competitions. And then um, they were going to competitions in the male and the female category. And in the male category, the athletes would have been awarded with medals. Okay. Or, or sometimes with a prize, financial prize. And I have received, and this has happened in Switzerland, which is unbelievable. <laughs> uh, I was uh, given a flower. God. And here in Macedonia, I was given a dress. That's so embarrassing. I was given a dress. It was a beautiful dress. <laughs> At that time, I thought that's very nice. I was very uh, grateful because I thought this is what girls should receive, right? Of course, I always wanted a medal as well because I wanted to go back home and show it to my parents and put it in my Did in my room. Did you not get a medal? Uh, at some of the competitions, uh, the, uh, the, uh, but this I'm talking like many years ago. This has changed, but not so much. I will tell you as well why. I didn't get a medal. No. While the guys got yes, the medals. Yes, yes. while the guys got the medals. And I thought this was like, um, I would say like 15 years ago, how much, oh, maybe more, 20 years ago. Uh, and this has happened a couple of years ago. If you remember, there was this competition uh, in Ohrid that they organized uh, like marathon. Okay. And then if you remember the prize money for men and for female was very different. Oh, I know, yeah. Okay. That happens all the time. Yeah. Yes, but that's very wrong. Because their excuse was that there are not enough women. But then how would you attract women and what's the message that you sent as an organizer to event it make that, any you're, sense. that you run the same, you do the same, but you're going to get paid double less. It's understandable. Okay. So, it's, uh, so we, uh, unfortunately, the sports sector here and the girls and the female athletes are not very educated and empowered on that. They don't know their rights. And I'm working very hard on this to raise awareness what gender equality is. So the years ago when this happened, uh, it was the NGO sector here, the women's rights organizations that we were mm -hmm. working, that we went very vocal about that in media. And it is how the organizer has changed the price money and they yeah. were equal. So we show them that this is a very wrong message and it's a wrong way to organize an event. It should be equal to everyone. Right. Um, so since then, I've been working very, and one of my really tangible actions that I want to achieve is that I want to make every girl and woman aware of what gender equality is, what means equal opportunities and rights in sport. For example, another example is that um, many of the leaders in the 
national federations, most of them, 95% are men. And you know what means a leader of one federation? Means that you get to have the overview and to decide about the policies, okay. about the competitions, about the rules of different things that you organize. So all the decision making process, it's now in Macedonia, but also in other country, because it's a global phenomenon, gender uh, gender based uh, discrimination in sport. Um, it's decided among men. So if you don't have a women, women participating in that decision making process that will say, OK, this is not right because here I don't see enough budget for female category or I don't see enough budget for uniforms for women. I, we still have women Olympians that were wearing male uniforms. I know. I know. We still have women Olympians that were transported with a bus to a 1,500 kilometers competition while some of the men were flying with airplanes. And we still have a lot of um, sports that is covered in the media and it is the male sport. It's not the female sport. Yeah, so no one knows. And there are still these gender, gender um, stereotypes that women's sport should be graceful and should be, they should look nice and they should take care of their body. But uh, so they should not ruin their bodies with sport. Mm -hmm. And is there all these pressures that women and girls have? and not having equal access to sports clubs. There's so many clubs for boys, for example, in football. Now that is changing because they're investing a lot of money in the women's sports as well, in women's football. But there are so many, so many more opportunities for boys and men to train than to women. For yeah. women, they're the fitness clubs. Why? Because we need to look beautiful, <laughs> right? Because we need to be toned and we need to look in a certain way. But if you go to weightlifting or if you go to box, if you go to judo or some martial arts, which is much more male dominated, that girl very, very often has barriers either from the family, mother and father, that are not happy that she, ha she has chosen that sport, from the friends, from her boyfriend. You know how many times many, many girls tell me I dropped out of sport because my boyfriend was very jealous because I started going comp doing competitions and trainings and then yeah. I dropped. And then and from the coaches as well because we have very few female coaches and we have a lot of men coaches. And when the girls want to practice, especially in puberty, when you're going through this transformation in your mm. body, you need to somehow sometimes feel safe with female coach yeah and many of the girls don't have no, that don't have yeah. it. and the male coach unfortunately and it's not their mistakes but unfortunately they're not educated that they there is a where. difference yeah. in the approach yeah. with boys so there's a, such a complex it is it environment is complex, yeah. and there are many 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 also. traits yeah. we have alini silva she's a wrestling champion in brazil the first one in the category to be a woman. And she said also that sports of contact, usually many women are harassed or abused because of the contact, like uh, jujitsu, for example. I'm or really it, sorry to yeah. interrupt you, but it's, it's on this topic. I, last week, I recorded an episode which will come out tomorrow and you'll be very happy to, to watch it because it's about a father and daughter uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu masters. The daughter oh, wow. is 16 year old. Mm -hmm. I attended their training. She choked me three times. <laughs> a 16 year old, the daughter of the master Jiu Jitsu, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. So it, it's small, but uh, I, I see, I understand the, the complexity. Uh, uh, I understand the different attempts that you try to uh, be active in voicing the change. But I, I just wanted to mention that because you already started talking about Jiu Jitsu yeah. and I was thinking about it. tomorrow night, it comes out uh, and she's going to go to the world championships. She's very successful. Wow, she nice. spars with guys. She's here from Macedonia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, okay. the, the club. She's trained by, the, by, the, by the, her father? The father is okay. her trainer. Okay. He's the owner of the, the club, the strongest Macedonia. They specialize cool. in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and she's this humble, positive, incredibly strong 16 year old <laughs> Here we go. girl the power who's going to go to represent our country. 
and her father is right by her side. It's a good example. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are many of them, of course, yes. Yeah, so one thing that I'm really sorry I interrupted no, no, you. No, Maybe you going. had a train keep of thought. Going. No, no, I'm fine. Uh, there, there's one thing that I'm actually still interested in. How do you, how do you motivate the following change? I understand the the prize money. I understand the. You 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 said it right. It it's the equal opportunity. Forget about the outcome. It's where the lack of opportunity grows or the all the inequality and in Macedonia specifically but probably worldwide I'm I'm sorry to see that girls and women are just not doing sports and I'm kind of guessing it's because of lack of opportunity and the social pressure and all that I know how much we can influence that, but if we could at least have the opportunities, then maybe the rest of the things will not be so bad. Are there programs, workshops, things that you can help with that bridge that gap? I mean, I don't want to say forget about the other things they are equally important, but to me, this is like the root cause. Even if a girl wants to go, She's going to go and there's there's not going to be a female wardrobe or yeah. or like basic things like that. How do we make at least the opportunity so that then we have more girls training? I think the first thing is to raise awareness about the issue. Maybe some clubs or some men coach doesn't even know that happens. I think it's important to listen to these girls and understand what is the barriers, for example. Sometimes they don't feel safe, like they want to practice... Uh, jiu-jitsu for example or boxy but there's only boys and they feel kind of like mm. is this a safe place for me so in brazil the coach the men coach should talk about this to the boys like the girl is gonna practice jiu-jitsu and it's not only a uh, class for girls it's boys and girls together so you need to do respect there's like yeah. boundaries that cannot be crossed especially in contact there's a lot of contact in your body because you need to choke or you sit in someone's body to do some you know so you need to be very aware and respectful otherwise me as a woman i wouldn't join a club that i don't feel the man there is respecting me Mm -mm. because i would Mm -hmm. feel fear yeah elena which is a mutual friend she's amazing she mentioned a very interesting thing that I was I thought that maybe is still active as a female idol a living legend basically yeah she went just on her own no money nothing visited schools so maybe with my previous questions I was also interested in that regard are cuz I th- I see it as an opportunity where just go to the schools just tell them go train something (laughs) like the the example you mentioned that was for a girl that already found out she wants Mm -hmm. jujitsu i'm talking about the millions that doesn't even think don't even think of oh i could go train something that's where Mm -hmm. i see a gap because i'm sure at seven year old there's no discrimination it's a school it's first grade they all start then somehow the boys know that they can go train something you you see where i'm Mm -hmm. going and and elena mentioned she she started going to schools and that seemed productive to me like that that's a great place to start because you reach the most people like like i mean that you might reach 200 in a day just first graders are there maybe i don't know things like that just to Uh, so um there are different ways i like creating policies because before i was also working at a national level i think when you create a policy on national level it has bigger impact but at the same time you can also engage individuals like helena going to schools and trying to see if that makes sustainable change 
You mean like a governmental yes. thing? Ah, okay. Yes. So ah, okay. I was working, I was an advisor to the prime minister for two years on sports. So in my perspective, I always look at how to multiply that. I don't, so you didn't know that about me. <laughs> you missed out. <laughs> the, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> the ministry thing? Yes. I might have. Okay. Sorry. I mean, I, I told you there's, there's <laughs> so, so many, many things. things on your LinkedIn. I know. And I'll tell you a new, a new one that you don't know about me as well. Uh, remind me at the, at the end of the podcast. Okay. Uh, so uh, at a national level, what other countries do, because I always follow the example of the EU countries, when they see a problem, uh, and it should be ev evidence-based, like a research, and we had here a research years ago, we don't have a new hmm. one, but we have a research that shows that uh, I think it was like 20 percentage less girls practicing sports than boys. <laughs> it was okay. a national research because we need data. We can't, we can't just say, oh, I think girls don't practice or boys okay. practice more. It should always be evidence-based if you don't want to be like um, improvising. No? So, but we have this data. And even though they are years old, we know that girls are much less engaged in sports activities than boys. So as a country, as a policymaker, what you could do and what other countries are doing is exactly investing more and doing incentives. Bless <coughs> you. I thought that meant bless you. Uh, and then you're doing incentives, which means that you do more activities to counterbound that negative effect. Okay. Other countries, what they do, they offer very often free access, no pay, no fee for girls in certain sports. In sports when they know that there are less girls, like football and martial I arts understand. and so on and so forth. They offer more education targeting parents because very often it happens with the parents. That's very The parents, correct. I have two boys. <laughs> I have two boys, uh, but I know uh, my friends that have girl and boy. Usually, it's the boy one that starts first, that first starts the uh, sports. So you take the boy first to sports, and, and then maybe the girl. So we need to educate the parents as well. So on a national level, you can do actions. And you can pilot maybe somewhere in some city or ah. some schools and see if that is has an effect or not. Like this, a project demo. Yes, yes, like, okay. a, like a city, like a, or or schools or a municipality, and then you see, uh, and then you see what are the barriers that usually uh, why girls are not involved yeah, in sports, and usually it's like that. It's like lack of free time. Uh, free time for the girls. For, for the girls, when they when they start the primary school and when they go to high school, it's the parents themselves saying you got to choose education or sport. It happens very, yeah. very often to girls. So they don't stick to sports. But even at a younger age, we have to be more open for and more attractive to girls. So you see a municipality where they don't have um, clubs for girls in track and field or in triathlon yeah. and biathlon. You give them incentive. You give them incentive what? to the local club that should open only free of access, free of charge for girls, so attract more girls. So okay. there are so many ways, if someone wants to really deal with this problem, it's not science fiction. There are so many countries that have done that and they're still doing that. So for every problem, there is a solution. The problem, what I see is that our people don't see that, don't recognize that problem, and therefore we don't have any targeted solutions towards that. Oh, you're saying they're not even seeing there's a problem. I'm saying they're not even see they yes yes because oh. <laughs> because uh, I thought it was more than obvious. Well, then why are we doing doing anything to change yeah, that? Yeah, that was going to be my I next mean, question. If you, if, it, if you are person with you know a normal person, we would like to change that and to have more equal opportunities and more girls. This is not a problem only in our society. It's a problem worldwide. Yeah, I can see Sport, that. Sport yeah. it's a male still male dominated sector, yeah. and very often you have much more boys and men. Uh, practicing, but yeah. I'm saying about because what I care it's about our girls and boys, no? Yeah. Our young people. So that is why it's important to act on both levels, on a policy making level to try to make changes that are strategic changes, and then also at individual levels having like good ambassadors, like good role models, 
having them being more visible, like yeah. Elena and other female athletes saying what they have achieved, going to schools, being more present with young people and trying to have, uh, trying to, uh, how do you say, like to, uh, the power of sport and transformation of sport should be closer to them. So whether there is a social media they use, you should be present there at the social media platforms. You always have to find a way to connect with the youth, yeah. with the young people, or with the parents if they need education. So for every problem, there is a solution. The thing is, if we recognize the problem and if we are good enough to find uh, the solution that, that, that exists, it's not something that we are going to come up with. Yeah. Has there... And it's just me not knowing things. <laughs> Has there ever been like a research or maybe like a demo project that you mentioned that brought the level of opportunity so equal to, to kind of see if given the choice, do boys and girls, yeah, you can, you can go in, no problem. Maybe this is too utopian. Maybe mm. it's never really realistic to think about this. Maybe we're far off. That's why I said it's just me not knowing. But has there ever been something like that where in this ide ideal world, given the same choice, would they equally choose the same things like, uh, like participation in sports, boys and girls? I wouldn't know. I mean, well, you can't mean, even know, right? Because you, you wouldn't know because it also comes from their background. You know, maybe in family they have someone that does yeah, sports or certain sports, or maybe they've been, um, how do you say, exposed at TV to a certain yeah. sport. So they naturally think that they should go there. Or maybe their father is cheering for football. Mm. So the boys naturally goes for football. What I think is that young people should be given choices and yeah. being exposed yeah. to experiences. That's right, yeah. And giving them the education that they need, the, the basic information, like this is this sport, this is this sport, and maybe trying, they, they should all try it. My kids, they tried uh, all sports like different sports. Have they and stuck then, to one? <laughs> unfortunately not, <laughs> I have to be honest. But I still have hope that they will stuck with tennis. Uh, but his wish was that he wants to try different sports. So I didn't just, okay, I told him, okay, have to, you have to stick with these sports. He, need, he, has, he needs to have the freedom to choose yeah, himself. No, of, course, yeah. of course, sometimes when I see he's a potential in some sport, then I have to be a bit more supportive to push him in that direction. But it's his right or her right to choose the sport. As an environment, we need to be supportive and to give them the experiences and exposure to yeah. different yeah. activities. Yeah. No, yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, it was too hypothetical. You're right. You, you can't isolate that much mm -hmm. like cultural... But as more yeah, women you have in sports, probably more women will, will join sports. Joining sports. Uh, look, I was, my life was changed just being in this position of looking this 16 year old girl demolishing like other yeah. guys there and girls just so skillful, so strong. And, and Jiu Jitsu, which is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Th that's an art like yeah, she's artistic totally. and that that's the only thought i had like imagine if there's a lot of these girls yeah anyway the strongest macedonia that club i think they're on the right path i i didn't feel any of the things that uh, you've mentioned in terms of inequality uh, not being comfortable Everybody there was respectful. There were several girls. She was just the best one, but younger, older. Uh, That's good. Yeah, the master, the president, he's, of course, it's his daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay. Yeah. As I said, this is, this is an endless topic. I mean, we can talk for, for hours just on this. And we have very few minutes yeah, left. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> we have to wrap up. Yes. I, I'm really hopeful we will soon have another opportunity to talk again but uh do we have time just for you to explain to me sport diplomacy <laughs> who's gonna tackle that one i think 
when you think about diplomacy also, it's about bringing different people together when you be building peace or when you're trying to get nations or people to get an understanding. That's also about being diplomatic. Yeah. So sports can be a tool for peace building as well. So the program that we are in is under sports for diplomacy. So where the money comes from is the State Department sports diplomacy sector. So they invest in the global sports mentoring program, believing that we represent sports for diplomacy by doing what we are doing here. I'm from Brazil. She's from Macedonia. We have a friend in Pakistan. And the next year, we are both going there to develop a project in mm -hmm. Pakistan. So that is bringing nations, culture, aspect. you know, okay. in gender specific, what we were, right. global sports mentoring program, sports for diplomacy for also gender equity. Does it make sense? I think so, yeah. Once you start mentioning the, the different countries, yeah. it kind of makes sense, yeah. And I will add to this uh, that um, sports diplomacy is when you use strategically sport for the diplomatic outcomes of the country, if you are working on a national level. Because when I was working at a national level, there are countries, a couple of countries in the world, USA is one of the best countries, France as well, they have a very strong component develop sports diplomacy, which means that through sport they promote their values, their culture, their language, their way of doing things okay. to try to get diplomatic outcomes. So you push your foreign diplomacy agenda in international context by using sports. So now in Paris, with having uh, Olympic Games 2024, uh, they're very strong on that by showing the world, because everyone will be watching about and inviting everyone to come to Paris. So besides sports, there's a whole different field that outcomes that they promote. Uh -huh. And uh, that is why it's a very strong tool, because it's a soft tool. So uh, it's a soft diplomacy, Yes. It's soft skills. So through sp everyone likes sports, like right? no one has anything I hope against so. <laughs> I everyone hope so. likes sports. <laughs> Every person on this planet has nothing against sport. When you say sport, it brings up good emotions. Yes. So uh, when you when you use sports strategically, not only for the competition for the results, but you want to get another outcome out of that, especially that if it's a uh, something connected to the policy at a national level, this is where sports diplomacy is practiced by diplomats. So sports diplomacy can be practiced at a diplomatic level by the MFA, the Minister of Foreign Affairs diplomats, mm -hmm. diplomats by career, which we have in Hungary, in France, in uh, USA. And it can be also practiced by individuals and uh, non-state actors, which are sports organizations, sports clubs, yeah. and athletes. Because we, as athletes, we are like uh, born sports ambassadors because we promote our yeah. country yeah, wherever we go, right? Mm -hmm. cool, yeah. And we promote the values because what an athlete has usually, there are exceptions of course, but usually an athlete has a good integrity, has good communication skills because they know how to communicate, has a great platform to engage people because many people follow them through their results. And uh, no, he's a, he knows about discipline, about self-confidence, all these good values. So by that, you are somehow already have the toolbox in your pocket to be a sports yeah. diplomat. Yeah. And what I'm currently working now on as well is that mm, developing the sports, you know that North Macedonia, we, we are very good on sports diplomacy um, level in the international context as well, because they, I've been to many conferences around the world talking about our cases, and we managed to organize when we were playing for the first time in Euro 2020 in Bucharest, Romania, two years ago, we organized uh, at the margins of that competition, we also managed to organize an uh, event that bridged um, commerce and trade between uh, Romania and Macedonia. So we brought uh -huh. our Macedonian product there using the platform of the football to have sports diplomacy event, but in a different context. Yeah, so you yeah, see yeah. how much sport you can use because sometimes athletes and coaches and sports managers are only uh, focused on one little thing from sport. Yeah, and sport is such a, yeah. such a big thing field you can use. So sports diplomacy, it's a more or less relatively emerging field. Um, uh, but it's going very, um, 
uh, strong in some countries. And luckily, Macedonia is going very well as well because, first of all, we have been in sports diplomacy programs outside of our countries, but also we have organized um, events like yeah. this to promote Macedonia on the margins of the sports competitions. And I hope that other officials from our country will also um, take a look at the strategic uh, level and strategic direction that they, they can use sport for and leverage it with different major events. It's good to attract mega sports event to be happening in in Skopje in Macedonia yeah, yeah. because then you get everyone to 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 know more about, about our culture so they can come and yeah. visit they will know our language so you really through sport you promote yourself and we are such a small country we need yeah, you know to yeah, be yeah, yeah. promoted and we have good athletes and we have good people that we can you know be promoting through well, that's so. why many countries want to host the olympic games for example oh that's okay that's so more than think, that's more than obvious if you think in a global aspect of it Sports have common and shared values between all countries. So that's something that brings us together mm. as a level of understanding as well. And the Olympic Games, since like ancient Greece, it has been an opportunity to bring different nations together under the same um, value of, you know, shared values yeah, yeah. to create understanding. So it's both things, like one country individually promoting that, but coming together everyone as a way to you know and by the way Tom, eh, we are da, 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 da. we are organizing actually we are launching it will be a master program on sports diplomacy and it's macedonian hungary together this is uh, the one Kay. of the latest projects that i'm working on it's a master program to teach sport uh, athletes or someone with um, sports background on how to become successful sports ambassador, uh, sports diplomacy ambassador. It will be one year master program that when that is finalized, it's going to be launched in one year. I will come again. <laughs> Mm, and I will, no, and I'll I will reach out to, to ask and, about and I will tell you because it's going to be theoretical uh, academic but it's also going to be hands on so we'll have participants or students of that master program will be also nice. staying in some of the or embassies or some minister of foreign affairs or some nice. big organizations that are working with sports as well so it's going to be like a blended experience and this is the first time I, I, I say it uh, out loud oh, this but is this is public. one of the new okay. new uh, project that I'm working on and as soon as I have more more information because there might be it will be global it will be open to everyone uh, but I hope that also Macedonians can join that program as well thank you thank you thank you thank so you. much for both of you <laughs> it was you. an unbelievable pleasure uh, it's I, I say this to all of my guests you literally fill my life with like the bucket for fulfillment mm -hmm. i just add more and more to how it. much more can you take i don't know it's <laughs> infinite I, I just love it so much you've kind of added this extra value to what it means to represent like to wear your national jersey something that i've actually felt you've just put words to it and and i i, I have guests that are like national team athletes i just hope they they see and they realize that it's not a trivial thing these these all these things that you so nicely talked about come together under sport and especially focused when it's the national jersey and, and for that i thank you infinitely thank and you so i much. hope for thank you for investing your time to create space for all this conversation inspiring other people we also feel inspired by you and the way you talk that we intensively feel things oh my god thank you yeah. thank you it was so very much. engaging <laughs> conversation i have to yeah, say and very a very good. pleasant one thank you thank you thank you so much you i <laughs> wish you all the best all the successes okay. i'm gonna be hearing from you for sure and uh, i'm i am aware of the time so i'm, I'm sorry if we kind of overstepped a bit i'm gonna let you go now guys this was an incredible episode <laughs> of course we'll uh, put the translation for all or all of our macedonian viewers and until next time till next, next time thank you, you. Bye. thank you <laughs>